Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Ashley Lagos. I am the creative director and women's pastor here at 12 Church, and we are in the middle of this series on the masculinity of Jesus. I'm preaching to you guys today from my car because as I prepared for this message, it brought up a lot of stuff in me. Whenever I'm trying to sort things out about what I'm thinking or how I'm feeling, I go for a drive. And I'll be honest, preparing for this particular message had me driving a lot. What kept resonating in my mind was just how countercultural he was. And as believers, what does counterculturalism even look like? He didn't concern himself with what other people thought of him. He was more concerned with what the father thought of him and what the father wanted him to do than he was with the opinions of others. In Luke chapter seven, starting in verse 12, there's a story of a widow woman. Not long after that, Jesus went to the village Nain. His disciples were with him along with quite a large crowd. As they approached the village gate, they met a funeral procession. A woman's only son was being carried out for burial and the mother was a widow. When Jesus saw her, his heart broke. He said to her, don't cry. Then he went over and touched the coffin. The pallbearer stopped. He said, young man, I tell you, get up. The dead son sat up and began talking. Jesus presented him to his mother. They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back. Look to the needs of his people. The news of Jesus spread all through the country. There's so many components of that story that clearly demonstrate just how countercultural Jesus was. He saw a woman who he knew was a widow. So he took into consideration her past, something that had already happened that was causing her pain. And then he realized that her son had died. And so something in her present that was causing her pain. And it says that he was moved to compassion. He felt for her, he was sad for her. He didn't want her to live a life where she was constantly struggling and wasn't able to take care of herself and was living with just this overwhelming grief because of all the loss that she'd experienced. And he did something crazy. Even today, you wouldn't go and interrupt a funeral. That's just not something that we do. Um, but that's what he did. He realized that in order for her to be healed and in order for her to have peace, he had to interject himself into a really messy situation, regardless of what it made him look like and regardless of what people's opinion of his involvement would be. To make matters um, more scandalous, he marched right up to the dead body and laid his hands on the Brielle, I believe is what it's called, the, the platform that they carried the dead bodies in um, Israel on. And he put his hands on it and he told the young man to arise um, and he the man sat up and and was alive but touching something where a dead person lay was not acceptable culturally um, back then and it was not acceptable in the church in the synagogue the story goes on to say that the news of what Jesus had done by raising that young man from the grave spread far and wide so there were people who were like man that was awesome did you hear what Jesus did for the widow woman? Now her son is back. He's able to take care of her. This is amazing. And then you have the trash talkers who are like, oh my gosh, can you believe he did that? He's supposed to be a man of the synagogue. Oh my gosh, he's so unclean and so dirty because he touched a dead body. On and on and on. And time and time again, throughout the, throughout the scriptures, you see that reaction from people, usually from religious people. Um, when I was 22, I was sort of having a crisis of faith and I ended up getting pregnant with my now 18 year old daughter. And at the time I was just in this really kind of messy place. You see, I hadn't done any inner healing work at all about being molested whenever I was a little kid by some older friends or the sexual assault I experienced whenever I was in high school. Um, I hadn't dealt with any of that. and. When you have past hurt that is still inside of you that hasn't been dealt with yet, you don't necessarily make the greatest decisions because you're operating from a point of pain. I went to church. Now, mind you, I had not been inside of a church at all in, in probably a year because I was just really wrestling with some stuff. But that was a church I'd grown up in. Um, I 
got baptized in that church. My parents were the music ministers of the church. My dad and my grandfather were both deacons in that church. I had literally grown up in that church. So I was excited to be home. I, it's always nice, you know, to be in a familiar place whenever you're kind of having an identity crisis. So I go to church, I walk in, I sit down, second row back where my mom and dad had always sat. And there was a newish pastor who was, who had taken over the congregation. The pastor that I'd grown up with had retired. And as I sat there, I remember very clearly the pastor had seen me in the hallway and he kind of gave me just this almost like disgusted, pitiful look. And as he began his message, he clearly stated that originally he was going to teach on something else, but due to who was present, he felt like God was telling him that he needed to switch his message. What he ended up doing was preaching on immorality of sexuality and he basically from the pulpit called me a harlot. He was absolutely speaking directly to me. And it wasn't just me thinking that in my spirit. I actually had people who loved me come up to me after the sermon and say, man, Ashley, I'm so sorry that he did that. It was obvious that he was condemning me from the pulpit. Not one time did he pause and consider that maybe there were some things in my past that I hadn't dealt with yet that were causing me this deep pain. Not one time did he look at other situational elements that I had been going through and ask, are you okay? And neither did any other Christian person that I knew at that moment, none. Nobody during that season of my life or the subsequent years, not a single person who professed to be a believer said, man, she clearly is making some choices that don't make sense. What is going on in her? What is hurting her that is causing her to feel like this is the way that she needs to behave? Not a single person did that. And so as I prepared for this message and was driving around and thinking about how countercultural Christ operated, it challenged me, I'll be honest. It challenged me because I wonder how often are we countercultural as believers? And usually whenever we hear that word, oh, countercultural, countercultural, we're thinking about society. But how often do you hear we need to be countercultural to religion? We need to be countercultural to this Pharisee mindset that often comes with having been a believer for a really long time. Because sometimes the longer you're in church, the less in tune you are with the love of God. Because that initial moment when you got saved, that initial moment when Jesus reached down and grabbed you and pulled you out of whatever mess you are in has become so far removed that when you see a girl who's seven or eight months pregnant alone sitting in a pew, it feels more natural to attack her than it does to interject yourself into her situation, consider her past the way that Jesus did with that widow, lay hands on her situation and call her back to life. That didn't happen. And that doesn't happen a lot because we are countercultural to society, but we are rarely countercultural to religion. Rarely as Christians do we look at what's going on in our churches. Rarely as Christians do we look at what's going on with one another and say, you know what? There's some religion going on here that isn't in, in line with the word of God at all. And that religion is forcing people away from Christ. We have 1.2 million young people leaving the church every single year. And we have fewer and fewer men involved in church. And I genuinely believe it isn't because they don't want Jesus. It isn't because they don't believe that he can save them or that their life would be better with him. I genuinely believe that the reason there's a mass exodus from the church is because people can't find Jesus within the church. We are so concerned with our reputation and how we look and what people think of us that we don't share real stories. If you are going to live a countercultural lifestyle in the name of Jesus, you have to set aside what people think about you. You have to set aside your reputation. Truly masculine men are capable and willing and eager to be countercultural. 
I used to live in Detroit and did a ton of work with human trafficking victims and, uh, and worked in strip clubs with women, ministering them, praying with them. So when I moved to Phoenix, I really wanted to continue that work here. And I was, became a member of a church and I met with a women's pastor and I said, Hey, I really want to start doing strip club ministry. The women's pastor, we're sitting in Starbucks. I'll never forget this. She looks across the table at me and she says, I don't think that our women want to minister to those people. My heart broke. Uh, it still makes me emotional. And these are the these are the stories that I was thinking about as I prepared uh, for this message. Because those people, those people were me. And those people are surrounding us every single day. We are called to be with people that other people deem unworthy and unlovable and I genuinely think it breaks Jesus heart that as Christians specifically whenever we're talking about masculinity that we are more concerned with the opinions of others than we are with the well-being and the eternal life of humanity so I want to challenge you take a drive take a drive and think about the areas of your life where you may not be living counterculturally and not just counterculturally to society, but counterculturally to religion. If you profess to know Jesus and to love Jesus, and if you profess to be a Christian and you profess to be actively trying to walk that out, take a drive and evaluate your life because I have experienced more toxicity from a masculinity perspective inside the church walls than I ever had in the quote unquote world. We need to evaluate ourselves Christians and we need to stop concerning ourselves with what people think. We need to, like Jesus did, see people, assess what's going on in their life truly interject ourselves into the situation, regardless of people's opinions, lay our hands on people's situations and command it to come back to life. 